Joel Mokir is the Robert H. Strutz Professor of Economic History at Northwestern University. He has a PhD from Yale. He has taught and studied all over the world and has supervised many dozens of doctoral students in pursuit of the past. He joins us today to talk about his latest book, A Culture of Growth and the Creeping Revolution that Enriched the World. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. Can you explain to us what exactly was the Great Enrichment? Yes, well, let's, the Great Enrichment basically reflects the fact that in our time, we are richer and living at a higher standard of living than anyone who's ever come before us. And that even the poor of today in many dimensions have a material quality of life that exceeds those of the very uh, rich and the most powerful people who were living in Europe, even at the time of the Renaissance. And um, when I say in Europe, the same would be true for China, for India, even more so, I suppose, more you know, poorer areas than that, like, you know, uh, Russia, Africa, places like that. We are, you know, living at a living standard that is just unprecedented in human history. And it's not just that we have more stuff and that, but, and that we're eating better, but it shows up in all kinds of unexpected dimensions. You know, not only that we live much longer, you know, life experience, expectancy has doubled essentially in the last 150 years it used to be somewhere around 40 and now it is 80 in 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 uh, industrialized countries but there are lots of other things that, that 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 people should be aware of we are taller than people used to be all kind of other biological changes have occurred as a result of better nutrition better uh, environmental conditions. You know, we are better able to warm ourselves in the winter and cool ourselves in the summer and protect ourselves from all kind of nasty bugs uh, in the water and in the air. So, you know, there's this vast improvement across a very, very broad front in the material standard of living uh, that has taken place essentially in the last 200 years. And uh, until then, I would say, whatever changes were taking place were extremely slow, readily reversible, and that's no longer the case. And if you quantify these changes and you put them on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. Shoot, wealth it looks just like shoots a, it up. It looks like a hockey stick. It just uh, shoots up in the 19th uh, century, especially. There's very little change for most of history, and then all of a sudden, you know, it just jumps up. Now, the hockey stick... Analogy, of course, comes from climate change and from the you know the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is, of course, a, a byproduct of industrialization as well. So you know, we, the good stuff and the bad stuff come together, and the hockey stick can be can be taken as both an indication of our success and of the you know the hazards that that success entails. Why did this enrichment, this steep, sharp climb upward in wealth, why did it happen? where and when it did? Well, you know, that's the $64,000 questions. And uh, libraries have been written about this, and I couldn't possibly start to, to summarize it. You know, in, in a way, we probably have more explanations than uh, we know what to do with. Uh, people have pointed to all kind of, of differences, starting off with, you know, religion and... Um, you know, ending up is, um, you know, having to do with, you know, relative factor prices like high wages in spur technological changes and on and on and on. Probably be useful to separate this into two questions. First, one, why did it happen in Europe and not anywhere else? And the second is, why does it happen, say, in the late 18th century, in the period we call the Industrial Revolution? And not say at the time of Charlemagne or Julius Caesar, or or something like that. And I think that is though. So treating these two questions separately is probably wise. Otherwise, it gets it just it gets too you know you you're you're uh, biting off more than you can chew. 
And so uh, the question why Europe itself is already a, a vast issue, because, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, if you looked at the world in, say, 1500, suppose you were alive in 1500 and somebody told you, well, you know, in, in half a millennium, some part of the world is going to get extremely rich and, 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 and industrialized and some part of the world is going to be trying desperately to catch up. My money would be that people would say, well, obviously, it's going to be China that will be leading the world and Europe that's catching up. And that's not what happened, of course. And so there was something about Europe that uh, made it look very different from the rest of the world, because it's not just China that did not experience what Europe experienced. It was India, it was Africa, it was, you know, Eastern Europe and, and so on. And so Middle East, if you want. And so there's something about Europe. And what that exactly is, of course, has been the subject of a great deal of, of dispute among scholars. Uh, I tend to be very skeptical of the view that some people have uh, put forward that points to religion and basically says, well, you know, Judeo-Christianity had in it the roots of economic success. Uh, I find it sort of hard to believe for a variety of reasons I don't want to get into right now. But I think that there is something to this view in the sense that they point uh, to the fact that what people really believed and the sort of mentality and culture, if you want, is actually of greater importance than economists have to have typically assumed. Uh, in the last 15 years, I think economics has rediscovered culture and is trying to see how they can fit it into the overall scheme of things. But I don't think it's 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 religion per se. That anything, nothing about Christianity as such, even if we abstract it from the fact that Christianity, of course, contains a great deal of variation within itself, not only that you get a, a big split between Protestantism and, and Catholicism, uh, more or less, at the beginning of the period in which things start to happen at the end of the Middle Ages, but also that within Catholicism and within Protestantism, there's a fair amount of variation, some of which are more friendly to uh, economic growth and technological progress than others. Where I think we should be looking is at the critical fact that Europe is politically highly fragmented, which creates a competitive environment in which these sort of nation states or sometimes much smaller areas like independent city states are continuously competing with one another for political advantage and military advantage. But at the same time, Europe has a an intellectual unity that makes it possible uh, for intellectuals to produce for a large market. And so they get, in some sense, the best of all possible worlds. And that's a situation that you see nowhere occurring. In China, we do have, of course, a great deal of intellectual unity because the country you know, sh shares a written language and shares a, a Mandarin culture. But there is no competition between China and other states that were threatening it in, in, in the way it was in Europe. And I think that makes a very large difference. In other parts of the world, you get a great deal of fragmentation, but no intellectual unity like in India and in Africa. Europe, in that sense, has the best of all possible worlds. And this is something that, by the way, if you read the Enlightenment writers, and I cite some of them in my book, Kant and, 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 and Gibbons and David Hume, they all make this point. They all say, oh, one of the reasons that Europe is so advanced and they, the, the 18th century term they use is polite, which they use in a different way than we do. But they, but what they mean by polite is sort of progressive, if you want. And, and, and said the reason why this is so is because nations are competing with each other and nobody wants to fall behind. And they point at two things that, that, that we all learn in high school, for instance, how uh, nations that, that felt that they were in some way behind, uh, Russia is the prime example, uh, make a deliberate effort to catch up with the others. But even if the competition between, say, England and France, which dominates political history in the 18th and 19th century, uh, spurs both of these uh, societies to put a lot of effort in economic and technological progress. And so they were doing, if you want, the right thing for the wrong reasons. But the net result, and maybe the unintended consequence to some extent, is economic progress.
And that, I think, is what sets Europe apart. The question of timing is, is much more difficult. But I think my argument that what you needed to overcome in Europe is uh, the sort of ment what I think of as a, as a medieval mentality in which people basically view history as a, uh, a set of cycles in which things go up and things go down. You know, and this is this is an ancient view that you see uh, that, you know, strongly incorporated in 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 in, 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 in classical civilization. Uh, you know, the the, the most famous uh, the most famous uh, uh, example of that, of course, is in the book of Ecclesiastes, in which you know this sort of sense that you know the, the generation cometh and generation goeth, and there's nothing new under the sun. And so, you know, his, sometimes things go up, sometimes things go down. And this was still a widely held belief in medieval and even in early modern Europe. But what you see happening, and I, that for me, this is the essence of the Enlightenment, is a belief in progress. And that history really is not a set of ups and downs, but that there is a trend. And what people start realizing in the 17th and 18th centuries, that the reason this is so is because knowledge is cumulative. So that in the, in the 17th century, people like Pascal and Newton and Galileo would, without necessarily dissing the ancient scientists that they were all reading and, and quoting, uh, above all, of course, Aristotle, and they basically, you know, make the point that uh, you know, we know what Aristotle knew because we can read Aristotle, but not the reverse, right? So we know more because we, you know, we, we have learned things since Aristotle and we're learning more and more every day. And this, these things are piling up on top of one another. And I think that insight, that gave Europe a, set, a, a confidence in the possibility of progress that for me is the core of the Enlightenment. That said... I should add immediately that the possibility of progress is not enough. You also have to believe in the desirability of progress. And there are a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, well, progress is possible. We don't want any of that because industrialization is bad. There's, you know, alienation, immiseration, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole strand of thought that, that, that really uh, uh, goes in that direction. And uh, what you see happening in the 18th century, with some exceptions, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, people think not only that progress is possible, but that it's desirable, it, that it will raise mankind to a new living standard. I don't think that they could imagine how big that increase would be. But they all felt it was possible. You know, they, they, there's different variations on that. But if you read... You know, somebody like Condorcet or Turgot in, in France, or even for that matter, Adam Smith in, in England, they all believe, in Scotland, I should say, uh, uh, they all believe that progress was possible and desirable. And without that belief, I think the whole thing would have essentially run out of steam. Central to that narrative of uh, knowledge makers accumulating knowledge over time um, in, in your telling of it at least, is the search for power over nature uh, and that we can improve the human condition by exercising greater and greater power over nature. And I suppose my question for you is uh, you, you say this group of scientists and tinkerers and specialists is always very, very small, uh, a couple thousand at the most, and that they are teasing out uh, – masses of new information, useful knowledge that can be put to human betterment. And uh, I suppose my question is, useful for whom exactly? And is this the sort of thing that we should be skeptical of and wary about because elites like Bacon, for example, sometimes want specifically to use their power over nature to extend to power over other human beings as well? That is, to some extent, what people are trying to do. The power over nature always involves, uh, to a large extent, you know, interpersonal games in which I'm going to try to use whatever power I have over nature to jockey into a better position. 
But that said, I think it's very important to realize that what you see happening is that as people acquire more power, more and more of that is used for, for uh, the creation rather than the redistribution of wealth. And so if you, you may want to achieve power over other people to redistribute wealth and to gain a better bargaining position in society. But in fact, what people end up doing is, you know, creating a great deal of power over nature that is used primarily as, you know, a, a game against one's environment. You know, how can I pump water out of coal mines? I mean, a very mundane, a, a practical question, but that is a problem that they were trying to solve. And of course, the steam engine turned out to be uh, the answer to that, and then the steam engine found all kinds of other uses. Motivations may, in fact, have been, to some extent, gaining power over other people. So military uh, considerations were clearly a driving force. But that's, in the end, turned out to be largely incidental. Uh, what has really mattered more than anything else, that we have been able to, you know, harness the forces of nature to our needs and solve all kind of problems that basically just improved people's lives. I mean, for, for me, one of the most radical inventions of the Industrial Revolution had actually nothing to do with the cotton industry and the iron industry and coal mining and and, and steam power. It's actually uh, the vaccination process against smallpox, which you know happens in 1796, smack in the middle of the of the industrial revolution. But it's you know it has nothing to do with gaining power over other people. It has everything to do with solving a problem that kept people incredibly busy in the 18th century. You know, smallpox was a great fear, and you know, for good reason. It's a terrible, terrible disease, and it got worse in the 18th century. Uh, but basically, people were, you know, doctors were struggling all over Europe, not just in, 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 in England, to find a solution to that. And bang, you know, the guy figured it out. That, for me, is much more significant than the kind of technology that gives you power over other people. That said, that said, it is absolutely true that once Europeans were able to create this useful knowledge, that they used it to take control of other parts of the world, sometimes with more success, sometimes with less success, but essentially the age of imperialism is a byproduct of these technological revolutions. And, you know, everybody who studied imperialism grants that right away. The reason Europeans were able to take over essentially redistributed Africa and large chunks of Asia as well, for that matter, was because they had a superior technology. But those things, things tend to be temporary, even so they may have lasted many decades, because the you could, Europeans couldn't keep the technology for themselves. They couldn't stop the, you know, the first the Japanese and then the Chinese and eventually everybody else from acquiring these technologies and says, well, if you guys are using this technology to dominate us, we can to get a hold of that technology and use it to defend ourselves. And in some sense, we're still, <laughs> we're still living with the sort of final outcomes of that because the whole sort of debate about nuclear proliferation can be seen in that light. So I'm not going to get into that. But uh, but you see what I'm saying? I mean, this the, the, the domination of other people is in some sense a byproduct. And what's true for international relations is equally true for what's happening within a country. It's true that for at least a little while, um, there's some good reason to believe that what Karl Marx was talking about was not a bad description of what was going on. So you have capitalists who own the means of production, and they're using those to create a, 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 a huge amount of profit at, as Marx and Engels believed, at the expense of workers. We could debate that, but that's what they certainly believed. But, they could, but, they, but this is obviously not going to last. And eventually, the fruits of technological progress filtered down to very wide layers of the population, so that certainly now in Europe, you know, the, the classical problem of poverty as it existed still in, in, in the 18th century has essentially disappeared. I always am really struck when I travel to Europe. It's, the United States is a somewhat different story, but when you go to Europe, 
you actually have to work very hard to find poor people. I mean, I spent, I think I've been to almost every major town in, in Europe. And certainly in the West, you go to places like Stockholm and Zurich and Amsterdam. You, you see people who are rich and people who are less rich. But really poor people, people who are starving, who are, you know, uh, wearing rags, who are, you know, living in, in, in hovels, it's gone. It's no longer there. We, you know, the, you know, the New Testament says the poor will always be with you. Well, they're not. They're gone. And, you know, and good riddance, I would say. You know, this is, this is an absolutely unbelievable achievement that people don't fully recognize. It, this is a vast success. Now, that said, on a global level, unfortunately, of course, poverty is still a problem. But everything points to the fact that in the last 15 or 20 years, the number of people who by any definition should be seen as poor is coming down, and it's coming down rapidly. And if we have famines, if we have starvation, it's typically the result of stupidity and bad policies, not of the fact that we cannot provide for these people uh, if, we, if, if we had the political means and will to do so. Now, I want to pick up on a theme uh, that you mentioned earlier, and that is that ideological change, intellectual change, scientific advancement is basically a trans-political phenomenon. It's not something that's limited to some arbitrarily established geographic boundary, and it's not necessarily something that can be contained either, no matter how much some governments at some times may want to. Uh, and ideas, as, as you mentioned in the section on uh, cultural evolution, ideas kind of travel as an infectious agent um, from society to society. And I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the Republic of Letters that stretched across many different countries across Europe uh, throughout the Enlightenment and tell us exactly what was this phenomenon uh, what sort of people were part of it, and d was it an institution that people recognized in any sense, uh, or, or was it uh, far more fluid? Economics has, in the last few decades, rediscovered this idea of institutions, mostly thanks to the uh, work of my, my late friend and Nobel Prize winner Douglas North, but many others have played a role in it. You know, we, we, when I was a graduate student in the 1970s, institutions were something that sociologists talked about. You know, we in economics, we don't deal with institutions, but that's changed. We now are very interested in, in institutions. And then, of course, we have all, all kinds of minor issues, like what exactly do we mean by institutions? Where do they come from? What do they do? And so Doug and other people have been writing about this at, at great lengths. And that literature has tended to focus largely, if not exclusively, on the state, on national institutions. So if you read, for instance, the book by, by Asimoglu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, which has gotten a huge amount of, of, of publicity, they basically see institutions as something that's happening in national, on a national level. It has to do with governance. It has to do with adjudication. It has to do with conflict resolution. But it's all happening at the national level. So some countries have good institutions, and some countries have bad institutions, and the one with good institutions get rich, and the one with bad institutions don't. And what you're pointing to in your question is that some institutions were actually transnational. They did not respect national boundaries. And the Republic of Letters and its heirs today, which is essentially the world scientific community, if you want, are part of that. And um, they are institutions in the sense that, that North talked about, which is they have rules, and uh, people are aware of the fact that they are members of it, and they, by and large, play by the rules. Now, you know, like, if you don't play by the rules, then you're likely to be, in some way, penalized if you get caught, and, and so on. And the Republic of Letters, as far as I can see, is one of the first examples, not quite the first, I could come up with others, but... One of the first examples of a transnational institution. And it was recognized as such at the time. What it really is, and uh, I think in, in our age, we can really understand this better than in any other age, because we actually have similar, similar things going on today. It's a set of communication links between individuals who are exchanging information. So in, in some sense, it's very much like the internet, only, of course, much slower. 
And what it was based on, it essentially was based on two things, correspondence. People exchanged uh, letters uh, through an ever better postal system and publications, which is the printing press. And both of these things experience a great deal of, of improvement. Of course, the printing press is only appears in the middle of the 15th century, and postal services were getting better in the 16th century. And it allows people to communicate. And so who are the people who are communicating? Well, so you have obviously people talking about religion, philosophy, metaphysics, occult, all kinds of things that, that we don't think of being particularly important to modern economic growth. But among those people, there is a group, they would call themselves natural philosophers, and we would call them scientists. They wouldn't call themselves scientists. That's a, that's a much more recent term. But this is what they did. And so when somebody like a Galileo or a Newton or a Leibniz, just to point to the, to the, to the superstars, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of these people, when they think that they have a new idea, they don't keep it to themselves, nor do they keep it within the city which they're living. This is placed in the public realm. This is, you know, either published in a book, as, as, as of course, uh, 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 Galileo and Newton did, but even before that, they correspond and they said, oh, I have this idea. What do you think of it? And people go back and forth. And that creates a community and I would say, you know, it, it, it maybe a few tens of thousands of people at its at its peak. But what happens is that somebody has a new idea. Say William Harvey about the circulation of of, of blood. To just give you one famous example, that is being discussed. Even if the idea is pr is proposed somewhere in England, within a few years, people are talking about it in Krakow, in Madrid, in Paris, in Vienna. Uh, uh, you know, in Copenhagen, when these ideas spread out and people you go back and forth. And that created a scientific community that plays an incredibly important role in the generation of useful knowledge. Now, you ask me, useful to whom? My answer would be, who knows? <laughs> what I mean by useful knowledge is knowledge that is potentially useful in the generation of Technology, so this would include, of course, advances in physics, in chemistry, in in botany, in mathematics, in astronomy, in all kind of areas which are potentially useful. Now, when I say potentially useful, that doesn't mean that they're going to be useful tomorrow or maybe ever, but I think they are different from, say, insights in religion, in other areas of metaphysics. Uh, medicine would be another case in which uh, useful knowledge is growing very rapidly. And so those ideas circulate within Europe. And what that, of course, means is that when I have an idea, you know, most ideas that people have are bad. You know, most ideas that I have are terrible. And But, you know, it's sometimes hard to judge. So I, you know, I, I, I write some a letter or a paper, I send it around, and other people read it, and they say, oh, my God, this is complete nonsense, and they tell me I am. It's nonsense, and, you know, there's a back and forth. And, and, f and out of that argument arises something that will eventually become workable. And that, I think, is the kind of community that emerges. And you know, I tracked that in my book uh, a little bit, and uh, it's quite clear that we can actually... Uh, right, you know, its history is, is fairly well known. You know, it, the embryonic forms are there already at the time of Martin Luther, say, the beginning of the 16th century, but it really comes to its full flourishing in the late uh, 17th century in the age of Isaac Newton. And, um, and by that time, Europe really has a scientific community of, of sorts. Now, how many people were there in this? I said a few tens of thousands. To get be in it, you had to be at the very least, of course, by definition, almost literate, which is you know, a relatively small proportion of Europeans, certainly uh, much less than half. Uh, but more than literate, you had to be highly educated. You had to be, for most of the period, at least bilingual, in the sense that you had to be able to read and write in your vernacular as well as in Latin. This is clearly an elite phenomenon. It is not an elite necessarily of people of high birth, nor necessarily of people of great means. It's an intellectual elite. It's an elite of people who are educated, who are intelligent, who are open-minded, and who are considering themselves 
part of this sort of joint effort of making the world a better place by better understanding the forces of nature. And, you know, that is something that you don't see anywhere else in the world. I mean, it, and it isn't there in, say, 1450. And by 1700, not only that it's there, but everybody knows that it's there. In fact, there is, you know, by that time, and there is actually a Frenchman called Pierre Bayle who, who actually publishes a newsletter, which is called, you know, a news from the Republic of Letters. And they talk of themselves as if they are citizens of this republic, which of course doesn't really exist. It's a, it's a virtual concept. Uh, but, they, but, they, but it's a sense of identity that these people have acquired, which is only sort of semi, uh, they're only sort of semi-conscious of it. But, but, but clearly this is there and it makes a vast difference to the outcome, as I, as I think I, I try to stress in that book. Was there anything like an enlightenment from below? from people who were not uh, very highly educated, but who made a contribution to the growing uh, numbers of sciences nonetheless? The, the majority of people living in Europe at the time, with some possible exception of, 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 of England and the Netherlands, are still farmers. I mean, or I, I think it's better to call them peasants. And these people spend their lives working on the land, and they were typically uneducated. Most of them would be illiterate, and it's very hard to expect from them to contribute anything. Uh, once you go beyond that majority, uh, there is a large group of people, you know, you know, maybe more than, certainly larger than the intellectuals, whom I have uh, referred to as tweakers and tinkerers. And these are essentially mechanics, engineers, technicians, highly skilled artisans who may not be necessarily be intellectuals. They probably most of them would be literate, but not certainly not in, not intellectuals. These aren't the people who go to universities, and these may be not even members of the Republic of Letters, but they were people who were, as they call us in England, good with their hands. You know, dexterous, skilled craftsmen. You know, it's not enough to have good ideas and say, oh, you know, my God, we could build this and that, and without having the people who can carry these ideas out. So, you know, we, to give you one very well-known example, you think of Leonardo. So Leonardo da Vinci was a genius, and certainly uh, one would think of him as, as, a, as, as a member of a Republic of Leroso in the very early stages of it. And he wrote all, he, he created all these fantastic ideas that we know from his sketches, but none of the things that he ever dreamed about could be built at the time because the, because the workmanship and the materials just weren't there. 200 years later, you have people like James Watt coming up with an idea. And uh, James Watt says, oh, well, we could build a steam engine that would be much more efficient, would be useful, so blah, blah, blah. He needed somebody to build this for him, to drill the cylinders in which you know the, the actual compression took place. And lo and behold, they were there in England. And so those skilled artisans play a very important role. And without them, I think nothing would have happened. I, I wouldn't call these people enlightened. That's, that, that's, that's not what the Enlightenment was all about. But they are, an, in, I would say, an indispensable complement to the intellectuals of the Republic of Letters. And so what we should really think of is Europe has had, you know, was lucky twice. It was lucky because it had a Republic of Letters in which men like Galileo and Hooke and Boyle and so on and so forth could be active and exchange ideas. But it also was lucky because it had a class of artisans who had been well-trained. I, I used the word trained, not educated, and, 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 and that's quite different. They never, these may not have gone, people who may not have gone to school, some of them did, some of them didn't, but, but they were people who could actually build the models that these, that the, you know, the intellectuals dreamed up, and then scale them up and turn them into something that was economically significant. That's very important. And without those people, now you know, we're still not talking about 
the masses, we're talking maybe, maybe the top, perhaps 5%, and this is just a guess, 5% of the, uh, of the, of the uh, you know, working class. But these people were clearly critical. We, it's harder to, to pinpoint them. We know the sort of really exceptional uh, 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 members of this class. But many of them, these people will remain anonymous because they didn't leave much of a record. But we know they're there. Mokir argues that an elite upper tail stood on the shoulders of dexterous craftsmen, but nonetheless, those relative few had to drag along the many. On the whole, the places history has dragged us may be pleasing, at least from our point of view. But as Mokir also argues, part of history's value is that it suggests alternative paths to progress not taken. Discovering those submerged stories is what history from below and Liberty Chronicles is all about. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.